Hi everybody and welcome to the Mental Toughness and Body Show. My name is Rob Evans and I'm your weight loss coach, health strategist and internationally published author, helping take your mindset, your life, your business, your body and health from where you are right now to where it is that you ultimately want to be. Today I want to talk to you about leadership by example and there's a few different things happening around the world right now that has just inspired me to speak about this topic today. First of all, I want to address the issue of Australian company Rio Tinto. And for those of you that may not be aware of what's, what's happened there, let me just give you a little bit of a, a background. So Rio Tinto, um, you know, one of the largest, if not the largest mining company in Australia, miners of, uh, I think, iron ore and a, a bunch of other things. And they have been found to be responsible for the destruction of uh, these very historic caves and they're 40 apparently date back to 46,000 years old and I th- I don't know the full history of this but uh, I believe that there's some um, indigenous uh, like paintings and that kind of stuff uh, on the walls uh, within the caves and they've been you know archaeologically dated at 46,000 Years. That's a whole other discussion, an interesting process that they must determine that. Uh, but Rio Tinto, in their mining process, have destroyed the caves to extract whatever it is that they've been extracting. Now, they've come out and, uh, you know, apologised for it and um, said that, you know, mistakes were made, it was never their intention, etc., etc. And... Uh, it's been copying some some worldwide attention. Now you think, let's see, if you take a step back, you could say, oh, you know, corporations, you know, decisions are made, people make mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you dig a little bit deeper, you can find out a little bit more. Now, so what they did was obviously the board met and they thought, how are we going to stem the tide of negative press and, and manage this situation so that the company can keep moving forward? And so what did they do? Well, they decided that it was best to uh, basically lay off the three executives that were involved in decision-making, and that involved the CEO and a couple of other executives uh, that are being... Well, they've resigned, but... Essentially, they've been forced out, I guess is the reality of it, isn't it? It's like them saying, well, you guys have to take the fall for this so that our company can keep moving forward, Uh, so you're out. Now, you can think, all right, well, that sounds reasonable, perhaps. Obviously, somebody has messed up here, uh, and we need to uh, make sure that that mistake never happens again. However... What has come out is the fact that the destruction happened back in May this year. Now, what happened in May before they started mining was they engaged these top lawyers to basically come up with a strategy to circumvent any uh, injunctions that were placed against the mining in the area of the caves and to handle any uh, you know, fallout that would occur as a result of the destruction of the caves. So what they're, and this has gotten out somehow. So now everybody is furious because it's like, hang on a second, you just lied about the fact that this was a mistake and now you're saying that, well, they're not saying, but now the truth is coming out to say that actually you planned to destroy these caves and you got legal protection to help you fight against this, all for what? All for money. And so what example does that set? I mean, I think that's horrific. And so the impact on Rio Tinto has been that obviously the individual shareholders have been uh, very annoyed at this because the the lack of corporate responsibility and corporate example... Uh, but you've also got your, your big shareholders and your, your super funds that are also questioning their behaviour and contemplating uh, removing their, their investments. 
just a, a horrible, horrible example. Now, if you were sitting on that board, where, where's the leadership there? Where's the, the person or, or people standing up and saying, hang on a second, this is culturally significant. It's 46,000 years old. We cannot, we must not destroy this. What are we doing mining in this area? But instead, they've said, no, this is all about money and let's just find a way that we can protect ourselves and we're going to destroy the caves anyway. I mean, it's so wrong. So wrong. Such poor leadership. Sorry, I just need to take a drink of water. I've got a scratchy throat. Um, yeah, just so wrong. The next one I wanted to talk about is what's going on in my home state here of Victoria. And as I speak, I've got the TV turned down, but the, I believe that there's um, going to be an update shortly on what's going on. So the Victorian Premier here, we are living in the, the toughest restrictions of anywhere in the world, the longest lockdown of anywhere in the world, uh, just in our home state here. Now, there are many people that are starting to jump on the bandwagon and say that the power has just gone to this guy's head, uh, the Premier. Uh, so I believe it's called a governor in uh, the US. I'm not sure what it's called in other parts of the world, but um, he's responsible for... We've got the Prime Minister who looks after the whole of Australia, but it comes down to the states to make individual state decisions, unless the Prime Minister chooses to override those, I, I think. He can make federal uh, legislation. Uh, but uh, the choices that our Premier is making are starting to become very unpopular with people. And it's also come out that he's lied about certain things. So, for instance... He always talks about the fact that we only make decisions based on the medical advice. And like the, the one that's being talked about a lot at the moment is the curfew that we have in place. There's a curfew between five, you're not allowed outside between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. unless you're an emergency services worker, you have a permit, all that kind of stuff. Um, otherwise, you've got to stay inside. Now, he said originally that it was based on medical advice that that would happen, and then he said it was based on the police. Now, the media asked, this is in the week subsequent, asked the chief medical officer, and he said no, he, he wouldn't have shut down, and he didn't say that a curfew was necessary. And the police said the same thing. It's not, we didn't ask for it. And so then the Premier said, well, basically, I have the ability to be able to make these decisions, and... Um, he's basically made the decision. Uh, he hasn't put it in those words because he's making it sound like others have made the decisions, but that's the bottom line. He's made the call. And people are saying, well, you actually don't have any right to make that call. And um, he just says it's working, it's not changing. Um, there's some other decisions that have been made as well. So we've been issued with a, a roadmap out which is very, very harsh. And for us to actually come out of lockdown, we need to uh, have no more than five cases for 14 consecutive days to unlock. Nowhere, anywhere in the world has achieved that. So um, it seems unobtainable. But he's sticking by it. So what's happening is that more and more there are people becoming unhappy about it. These things seem unobtainable. Uh, and what that is now showing is some discontentment in the party, like his party. And they're not happy with the fact that um, the decisions that he's making are not necessarily agreed with by the whole party. So that it's coming to the point where they can see, I think, the broader picture. Hang on a second. Our leader here is starting to become really unpopular. And we've got to make sure that we're in jobs for a next term. And because they're, I think they put something out in the paper. If they called an election right now, he would lose for sure uh, because of the state of the, the lockdown. Uh, now, he won by a massive majority last time. But now he would lose by a long way, apparently, based on their... They're polling. Uh, so the parties now starting to look at their bigger interests. 
and saying, well, hang on, uh, we want to have jobs, we want to still be in power, maybe we need to start to looking for a new leader because this is starting to become unpopular. So it's, it's really interesting. I, I think because uh, he's under the spotlight so much each day for like 90 minutes to two hours of questioning, uh, it does look like the power has certainly gone to his head. I'm sure there's, there's an element there that's coming from the right place. He wants us to get out of this. But look, are all politicians the same? I mean, do they all lie? Maybe. Do they all distort the truth and not call it a lie? Um, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, politicians are, are spin doctors for sure. And uh, I think just the the harshness that this is impacting people's lives and livelihoods. And uh, I think there's a further, what are they saying? Because of this extra extension, um, so it finishes tomorrow, the, our original six weeks, um, so, and we're going to be locked down for at least another four weeks before there are any further changes. They're saying about another 250,000 more jobs will be lost because of this further extension. So it's having a huge impact on people's lives and livelihoods and mental health. Uh, so again, leadership, by example, is this a good way to lead people that require the change and require the confidence? I would say no. And now it's just being stubborn. It's like a, it's a case of, well, this is just what we have to do because I made the decision. If I make any changes now, it's going to make me look bad. Uh, I think this could have been handled so much better. There's uh, evidence to show that, um, that like our state government has messed up on aged care completely. And that's where the, almost the entire deaths from our country, I think we're up to about 1,000 now, have come from aged care and from our state. He's responsible for that because the other thing that was stuffed up was hotel quarantine. Every case of COVID that we have here in our state can be traced back to a breach of hotel quarantine, which they were responsible for. And then the last one is about the, uh, the tracking, the tracing, the tracing, the contact tracing. They've been responsible for that as well. Uh, now, no responsibility is really being taken for any of it apart from he says, well, ultimately the accountability stops with me because I lead the party, uh, but he, he won't commit to the fact that, well, who made the decision? He'll just say, oh, I'm not sure who made the decision. There are uh, minutes and many people involved, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and he won't, won't agree to it. So he, it's just not looking good as a leader. And I think what we might see happen in the coming days is uh, him have to resign or there's a, a leadership challenge and he loses. Um, it'll, interesting to see, very interesting to see. So today we have, as this come up on the screen there, that we have 37 cases, which is down from 700 about six weeks ago. There's six, uh, six deaths, um, unfortunately. Uh, so the numbers are coming down, but we're not getting to where we want to. Last one is about... Uh, what's going on between Australia and China at the moment. So they're playing kind of tit for tat in terms of what's going on. I think it started with, uh, gosh, I, might, I mightn't have the sequence of this right, but it might have started with wine uh, here in Australia where China said that they're going to stop uh, taking Australian wine in or they're going to tax it heavily or something. Then there was something about barley and then I think there was something about live um, whether it was like, like meat, basically, um, going to China as well. Um, and then China last, or was it this week, they tried to uh, arrest two Australian reporters and question them, and then they um, negotiated with the Australian government to uh, you know, let them out of the country, and so they're back home now. Uh, and then Australia is, oh, that's right, there was shutting of the consulates, and, and now Australia is investigating, um, uh, investigating uh, some Chinese reporters. Uh, so ASIO, our spy agency, is uh, investigating those. And it's just getting deeper and deeper. I, so I think it actually started with, um, how do you pronounce it, Huawei, uh, the phone company. 
Back in 2018, they wanted to set up 5G here and they said it wasn't going to happen because they believed that, um, you know, it's to do with China spying on us and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And you just wonder whether it's being managed the right way because it is going this tit for tat kind of thing. Now, we need China more than they need us. Yes, they use our iron ore for making all their stuff, uh, but uh, we need them far more than they need us just in terms of a, a trading partner. And you just wonder whether this is being managed the right way. And like you hear uh, Donald Trump talk about how uh, China has been stealing information and stuff for years. And I mean, you only have to go over there to see that, um, uh, you know, all the imitation things. I mean, they, they take things, they copy them, they produce them quickly and, you know, they're benefiting, uh, benefiting off other people's uh, designs and, and technology and everything. So I'm sure there's elements of truth. We just don't ever get to find the truth. But the, the key is what's the, the right way to lead here because... What we're seeing here is that, well, you do one thing, I'll do one thing. They, they do one thing, we'll do something to, to counteract that. It's like, it's, just, it's like tennis. You hit one over the net, all right, I'm going to hit one back. And I'm not sure that it, it's, uh, it's good leadership. And hopefully this doesn't end in something really disastrous, uh, like um, you know, military stuff. And you, know, you can see a whole range of different things on on China, uh, different stories about how they lead their country, how they're, um, you know, building ports through the Pacific and everything. Uh, with um, and China have said that it's for passenger ships, but they're making them for the size to fit military size ships. And you think, mm, what's the what's really going on here? China's attempts to gain power over the whole world, perhaps. Who who knows? You just you just don't know what's uh you know what's going on behind the scenes we just really don't know and communist country yeah you know any guess so how how do you get that uh that right communication well it's got to come from the leadership down doesn't it you i'm not seeing a lot of communication from the prime minister on this uh there's a little bit but then it's just different ministers that are talking about different actions that are are being taken i think there needs to be um, a, a greater meeting of the minds between the, the, the two leaders of the countries to really work things out here and stop this tit-for-tat stuff. So I think what I take away from all this is, you know, leadership by example is just so important. I mean, we've, there's three examples through there which are just showing that there are examples of poor leadership and the consequences of that uh, can be devastating. Uh, if, if you look at another one just quickly, which is the, I can't remember his name, but the CEO and uh, founder of uh, CrossFit, when he came out with the Black Lives Matter stuff and um, Floyd, um, I can't remember his surname. Um, I'm thinking of different Floyds, but uh, you know who I'm talking about, how the Black Lives Matter all started. And... Uh, he came out with some very racist comments and effectively cost him his company. And how did he see the way out of it? Well, sell it to the, well, the, the co-founder or, or whatever and to, so that they could just say, we've got to get you a distance from the company so that we can save the brand. Um, so it was probably costing him hundreds of millions and billions of dollars around the world. And their CrossFit Games, all the people... Had um, uh, the major sponsors had uh, pulled out and you've got your, the major, uh, you know, your top competitors in CrossFit that are also saying we're not going to support this sport anymore. We're going to do something else. So haven't heard too much more about that lately. But again, poor leadership, not listening to the people in his community and completely muffed it. Very poor example and, and just really disappointing. So when it comes to yourself... You're an entrepreneur, you're a leader. If nothing else, you say, well, I'm an employee, I'm, I'm this. Well, you're still a leader because you're leading yourself, first of all. You might be leading uh, your children and uh, they learn by your example. So you're in a, a great position to be able to influence 
the behaviour, the decisions of others. And you shouldn't take that with light responsibility. You should think about what are the qualities that you want to bring forth as a leader? How do you want to be remembered as a leader? And you say, well, I'm not a leader, but just remember what I just said. You are a leader. You're leading yourself. So how do you want to lead yourself? A lot of people don't lead themselves very well. We have a lot of negative self-talk and fear and immobilization that just stops us from achieving the things that we want to achieve in our life. So how do you want to you remember yourself as to what you did? How are you leading yourself through COVID right now, wherever you are in the world, if you're in a, the harshest lockdown ever like me, or whether you're sort of opened up somewhere around the world and you're getting a second wave of infections? Maybe there's people in your own family that have been impacted, but how, how are you leading yourself through this time? Because this is a great time of opportunity to step up and really test yourself as a leader of yourself so that you can say, well, it doesn't matter what comes my way, I'm a great leader. I'm leading myself through this. I'm charging through this. I'm achieving the things that I want to. I'm proving to my kids that it doesn't matter how tough things get, you still put your head up. You still get up. You still keep moving forward. You still keep working for, towards that success. Even if you're not being as successful now as you were in a, a pre-COVID existence, you're still moving forward. You're still growing. You're still building. And you've still got the best mindset that you can have. It's so important to keep moving forward, to keep focusing on creating the better version of you. And whether that's in your health, your, um, your business, your relationships, it comes down to how you're going to lead. And I want you to focus on leading with more, more passion, with more purpose, so that you can ultimately get to where you want to get to. It's not easy being a leader. Like you think about all those situations I just talked about now. I mean, unenviable positions to be able to lead a group in those situations. But sometimes it, it takes a tough decision to move things forward. So just in closing, I'm just going to give you an example, one example uh, that I have from my corporate experience uh, that I'm really quite proud of. So this was a situation when I was working in a... Um, a, a, a project team and a part of the job of this project team, we had a new C, oh, CEO, managing director come on board and what do most MDs do when they first take up a new role? They look at how can they cut costs and restructure and everything and that's what this one did. And I think we were, these numbers might be right, but it was about $250 million or something that they wanted to uh, cut from the business, which... Um, huge numbers given the size of the business. And uh, I was put onto a team that was charged at looking at, a, I won't say the, um, because people know where I worked and uh, you know the impact that it had and who was working there at the time and stuff, so I won't do that. Uh, but I was working on this particular business unit of the company, very big, and uh, employed a lot of people. And we were told that we're going to get rid of this business. Now, it impacted a lot of customers. It had a lot of dollars tied up in it and a lot of people. And so all those people were going to lose their jobs. And they, we asked the question, so what would we need to do to be able to save this? And they gave us a return that we would need. And so I'm going to make up the numbers, but let's say that it was um, 11% something like that, 11% return. So we worked with, there was two of us, or as, and we had a, a senior person that we could refer to, um, one of the executive general managers. So the two of us, we worked with the, um, uh, the general manager of the, the business unit to say, okay, this is the number we need to achieve. What are the strategies that we can imp, uh, put in place to achieve this? So we looked at everything. We looked at all the different distribution centers. We looked at uh, where the money was going out, how we could do things better. 
and uh, I can't give too much detail for confidentiality purposes, but we basically pulled each element of the business apart, looking at where every dollar was going and how we could r get the same result in terms of sales revenue, but a far less cost. And so um, we did that, and over time we got to 11%. So we got to 11%, we took it to the, uh, you know, the, the big boss that was reporting directly to the MD on this, and he said, no, nah, we need to get it to 15%. Actually, I think it was, might have been 17%, something like that. I was like, what? But what happened to the 11%? No, nah, we've remodeled it, we need to do this. Now, keep in mind, we found out subsequently after we were putting all this work that they just wanted it to go. They thought it was too hard and we weren't gonna do it. So we went back, we remodeled it, uh, we made some further changes and we came back to the 17%. Then we got told, and we were so pleased with it. And so they, they took it to uh, you know, this guy again and he said, no, nah, it needs to be, I don't know, say 23%. I was like, hang on, you're just setting us up for failure. What is, you know, what's going on? Why is this happening? So we went back again and we got it after some further hard decisions. We got it to 23%. And so we were really happy with it. So the very next day, we had to present that to our EGM, who was then gonna take it to the board. Well, it, was a, it wasn't the actual board of directors, it was a, an executive board. And um, so I went home that night, feeling really great about what it was, and we were gonna have a meeting the next day, and uh, to, before the presentation and um, I went in that day and the, my partner that I was working on it with, we came in, I was all excited and he said, I don't think I agree that we should do it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, we've been spending months on this. We've got to this position, why, why are you there? And he's, he did this in the meeting uh, that, that we were having with our EGM. And I'm like, I, I don't get it. Or, well, or what's un I don't understand. Dan was his name and John was the name of the EGM. And I said, why don't you feel that that's the case? And he explained it. And then Johnny asked me, and I said, look, because I, I was passionate about this. I put so much time into this and so would Dan. And I said, well, here's my thought. I said, I, if, if this was my money, I said, I would do this. I said, I would stand by this business. I said, we've crunched the numbers in all different ways. We'd worked with the GM. They believe that we can do this. It makes up, uh, uh, sorry, it makes sense. It stacks up to, uh, to get these results. And yes, we need these things to happen. And yes, we need to make some tough decisions, but we can do this. And I said, Dan, I can't believe that you have changed your mind overnight. I said, John, hand on heart, we can do this. We can save this business. We can do this. And he said, okay, well, let me take it to the meeting and, and uh, let's see. So we left that meeting. And I, after the meeting, I said to Dan, I said, man, what? I can't believe what happened overnight. And he said, look, I just... Re, re crunched it and he said, I just don't think we can do it. And I said, oh. Well, I said, well, I'm disappointed. Anyway, later that day, um, John uh, spoke to me and Dan and he said, I supported it and he said, we're going to do it and they accepted it. And I was like, wow, that's powerful. Like, that's the first time probably that I, I can remember it is for something so significant that somebody stood by me and agreed with what I said because they could see it as well. And guess what? Even to this day, like some, oh, what would it be? Probably 20 years later, the business is still running more profitably than ever and they're still using a similar model to what we put forth. And so... For me, that was a big leadership moment for me. 
it was going against somebody that was more senior than me, but I believed in it. And I believed in it from my heart. I mean, I, I knew the numbers made sense and I, I would have done it if it was my money because I knew that the numbers stacked up. So sometimes you've got to lead in a way that is not popular, but it's the right thing to do. Have a great day wherever you are in the world. Lead by example.